Defendants seek to exclude the following from being presented as evidence at trial. First, the shooter's journal seized from his backpack at the scene. Second, text messages from the shooter to a friend. Third, the shooter's internet searches. So today inside the courtroom, there was a lot of talk about what evidence is coming in, what evidence is coming out. I want to take a moment to take a look at what was going on inside this house before the Oxford school shooter struck and killed four of his classmates, injured seven others. Um, the judge read from some of the uh, papers that were filed in from uh, referencing some of the journal entries of the shooter. Let's take a listen. In response, the prosecution seeks to admit specific statements from this shooter's journal, including the following, uh, quote, I have access to the gun and the ammo. I want to help, but my parents don't listen to me, so I can't get any help. I have zero help for my mental problems, and it's causing me to shoot, shoot up the fucking school. My parents won't listen to me about help or a therapist, unquote. <clears throat> In addition, the prosecution seeks to admit statements from the shooter's journal evidencing his intent to commit the school shooting, such as, quote, the shooting is tomorrow. I'm about to shoot up the school and spend the rest of my life in prison, unquote. First line of defense. His parents, in this case, his parents. You're hearing it from the journal entries. Now, they may claim at, at trial that, you know, these are all lies and never happened. But let's bring in our experts to talk about this. Joining me now in Los Angeles, California, forensic psychiatrist, trial expert, witness, columnist, Dr. Carol Lieberman, also with us in Los Angeles, California, clinical and forensic neuropsychologist and associate professor at Pepperdine University, Dr. Judy Ho. Great to see you both. Uh, Dr. Carol Lieberman, let, let's talk about that first line of defense. I mean, it seems extremely obvious to me that there were problems here. We were talking about the, the bird head in the jar. Well, let's go right to the journal, what he's writing here, that he wants, he wanted help, according to his journal. Yes, his journal um, is so damning. I mean, however, you know, whatever things are let in the Instagram or not, or, you know, however many things from the journals, there are enough things that will be let in that are just so damning. I mean, there were so many red flags in, in the years, really, leading up to the school shooting that their parent, that his parents just ignored. And I mean, it's so pathetic when you hear what he was saying, I thought of calling 911, but I knew my parents would be really pissed. I mean, but I, you know, but he's talking about auditory hallucinations, visual hallucinations, uh, paranoia, all kinds of things. And, and, you know, his father gives him a pill and, and tells him to suck it up. His mother laughs. And, and then they literally put the gun in his hands right before he did it. So they were just totally neglectful. They were, they were more uh, interested in taking care of their horses than they were in taking care of their son. And the judge did let that in, the money that they spent on all their horses. Dr. Judy Ho, and I, I understand, I'm a parent, uh, you know, three children. They're, they're all of adult age now, but, and I understand you don't know everything that's going on in their lives, but you try to understand, you try to look for signs that things aren't right, and when they aren't right, you do whatever you can to get help, and, and, and sometimes you may fail. The problem here is that it didn't seem like there was even that attempt. And Vinny, you're absolutely right. As parents, we generally want the best for our children. We try to keep on top of what they're doing and maybe we don't know everything but parental monitoring and the attempt to try to stay with whatever your kid or your teenager is up to trying to ask them questions getting involved in their life being more engaged even if they say i'm annoyed by this don't keep asking me these questions you persist why because we have 
decades of research that show that parental monitoring is one of the most protective factors we have against children and teenagers going astray, having mental health concerns that are not treated, and of course, a lot of the other negative consequences that can come with that. Now, this is obviously a very extreme case. Not everybody who is mentally ill is gonna go and shoot other people, but this is somebody who has had, as Dr. Lieberman already mentioned, a number of red flags. If the parents were paying more attention, and if they got wind of even one or two of these red flags, they should have intervened. Now, I understand that the judge has said, we're not going to allow in certain other types of circumstances that um, the jury is not gonna hear about, for example, the parents own substance abuse or the fact that the mother had an affair. But maybe some of these things were distracting from their parenting abilities. Maybe they were not able to attend to Ethan fully because they had all of these other negative factors that were going on in their own lives. I want you to take a listen now, uh, the judge also talking about some text messages as we are taking a look at what was going on in this household, what was the situation like, and um, you know, trying to figure out like, okay, was it really that obvious? Because right now it seems so obvious. Let's watch. The prosecution seeks to admit the following from the shooter to his friend on April 5th, 2021 at 12.38 a.m. Quote, I'm going to ask my parents to go to the doctors tomorrow or Tuesday again, but this time I'm going to tell them about the voices, unquote. And these messages authored by the shooter between 11.59 p.m. and 12.39 a.m. on April 4th and April 5th, 2021, quote. Like I hear people talking to me and see someone in the distance. I actually asked my dad to take me to the doctor yesterday, but he just gave me some pills and told me to suck it up. Like it's at the point that I'm asking to go to the doctor. My mom laughed when I told her, but I'm having bad insomnia right now and paranoia. I need help. I was thinking I calling 911 too so I could get the hospital, but then my parents would be really pissed. Like I'm mentally and physically dying, unquote. Dr. Carol Lieberman, the, the, the bottom line, I mean, teenagers, especially teenage boys, a lot of times they, they don't want to talk to you. They don't ask you for anything. And that's, that's usually the challenge is, is getting through to them to say, hey, do you, what are you thinking about? What do you need help? Here, it's like the opposite. I don't understand this. I don't recognize this. If, if what he's writing is true, okay? Again, if he's, what he's writing is true, um, like a, a, a teenager reaching out to his parents saying, I need help? Well, first of all, that tells you that he has been needing and wanting to ask for help for years. You know, he's finally gotten to the point where he's so desperate that he's actually going to do it and acknowledge that he needs help. But, you know, these are parents who uh, left him in the house when he was really young and they went out drinking and um, he had to go to a neighbor's house to ask her to call them and so on. So they have been neglecting him from for his whole life, just about. And the bird, the reason why the bird head is important is because that's one of the signs of the triad, the sociopathic triad. Um, torture of animals, bedwetting, and fire setting. And really, I think that they were just parents who were nurturing, a, well, so to speak, a, um, a sociopath, a growing a budding sociopath throughout his life. They were totally neglectful all the time. And it did take a lot for him to finally say, I'm gonna, you know, knock, get their, try to get their attention and tell them that, uh, that I need help. Uh, Dr. Judy Hoke, do, do you have any idea what may have been going on in the minds of the parents? Like, it, it, and again, if this is true, if your son, who's a teenager, is reaching out to you saying, I need, I need some help here, and, and why would you not do anything and everything? I mean, that is such, for, for anyone who's ever raised a, a, a boy knows this, how difficult it is to get them to communicate with you during those years. That's why I don't understand how you could react allegedly the way um, he describes. Well, Vinny, I think there were a few things going on in this household. One, the parents had their own issues that they were not dealing with. 
their own substance abuse issues, their own marital issues. It does not sound like the house was stable at all, and the parents may have been wrapped up in their own problems first and foremost. Secondly, the parents appear to have some type of stigma against any kind of mental health plea. And unfortunately, we do see that this is still happening across the world and in our country, and even in areas where we find that people have been educated on how important mental health is. The fact that the parents were saying, here, just take some pills and suck it up. That type of attitude is saying, don't tell me about your emotions. Don't be a weakling. Why are you telling me you need to go to a professional? This is not what we do. And if that indeed was the case, then Ethan, of course, would be feeling even more disconnected and feeling like he wasn't accepted by his family and his parents, especially. And thirdly, I think the parents were honestly just trying to turn a blind eye. I think they were hoping that this was nothing serious. Oh, he's just being a teenager. We got other things to deal with. Instead of really paying attention, hearing his words, hearing his pleas. And when you see what's in his journal, when he wrote words like, I wonder how many people I will kill. I have lost every hope of life. Help me, help me, help me. The fact that he has been pleading in all different ways, written and verbal, and his parents just ignored it and swept it under the rug. I think that that is really the final nail in the coffin, pretending that this is just an absolutely normal teenage phase when clearly he was so disturbed and crying out for support. And I think that's why we are where we are right now. I mean, it's extremely unusual. I don't know if I've ever seen this before, where the parents of a school shooter are also facing charges for the deaths of the victims.